Uh, I'm going to have some folks come on now uh, who were really instrumental in the protest this morning. Uh, they organized a protest against uh, a gubernatorial candidate here in Georgia, Stacey Evans. Uh, I am not going to bullshit you. I don't know Georgia politics, and I don't know Stacey Evans that well, so you're going to have to tell me uh, what policies of this gubernatorial candidate, and I believe she's now a state representative, correct? She is currently yeah. So tell me about uh, what groups you guys are from, why you wanted to uh, protest her, and how you think it went. It looked to me like there was at least like two dozen protesters. Approximately, yeah. 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 Well, uh, Jordan, thank you so much for taking time to uh, talk sorry. with us. What, tell, tell the audience your name. Uh, my name is Anoa Changa. I'm host of The Way with Anoa, um, formerly of the Progressive Army. Uh, I am here. I'm located here in Atlanta. I work with several different groups um, across the country, and um, I'll let my, my, my other folks introduce themselves as well. Yeah. Hi, I'm Tracy Quarter, um, host of That's What She Said and also um, at CPD Action Fund. I'm Mundell Robinson and I'm black. We got you. <laughs> Love it. Love it. So tell me about uh, Stacey Evans, uh, what are the policies? Because to me, without knowing a record too much, I'm seeing a lot of parallels to like Hillary Clinton and other candidates like that who are qu running on, I'm a progressive, all of these, but their record might not match that. Well, I mean, the, the big overarching issue is that we've had this, you know, this conversation, whether it's been in independent media, you're aware of this, whether it's in independent media or these progressive spaces about who is a progressive and who isn't. And there seems to be a litmus test that is only applied to certain candidates. Um, and I'm not opposed to holding people accountable to the values that we all say that we support as progressives, but education has been made an issue in this race. Um, you know, this was not about supporting one candidate over another. This is about the narrative that if you don't support certain things education wise that you're not really progressive well in this case we have a candidate who was added you know to the last minute to be fair or whatever they did you know who has these you know problematic issues in terms of privatization from school vouchers these are things that many of us have shut down about talks about Cory Booker for so if we're going to say that Cory Booker is not a progressive because of these issues how can we then say oh but Stacey Evans gets a pass like that's not okay like my, my what I encourage folks to do is if we're saying that we have these values if we're saying that this is a, a, important at the most progressive you know largest gathering in the country then we need to hold to that um, consistently across the board so so right now we have a national movement of education equity you know education um, you know, funding equity, you know, education as a whole, you know, saving our schools. We have black and brown schools, poor schools being decimated across the country, whether it's in Chicago with Rahm Emanuel. Um, we, we've seen, we've seen all down in Louisiana. We've seen, we've seen what privatization, we've seen what school closures do to our communities. So no, we can't just sit there and say, oh, but we're all progressives or we're all Democrats and just smile and bear and grin it. Like this is a very real issue that needs to be addressed and needs to be discussed. So I understand folks don't like moments of discomfort, but the only way that we can improve and be better as a progressive movement is if we work through this and, and move forward. And her, her shouting hope, hope, hope over us was a problem because that refers to the Hope Scholarship, which is one of the major criticisms that they have of her opponent, you know, Stacey Abrams, which again, I don't, I don't have a problem with criticism and critique of candidates. That's fine. But there's been a lot of it of one candidate and not of the other at all. Just so my audience, just so my audience understands. So uh, Stacey Evans uh, has supported privatizing schools, school vouchers, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, that, and that was that was the handout that was passed out earlier to show parallels. Like folks have made a big deal about how you know again using Cory Booker as, a, as an example, since that's someone that has been used in democratic spaces, progressive spaces, as being close to Betsy DeVos. As we're talking about this national effort against policies coming down from from the Trump administration, etc. Well, we have a, someone here in Georgia who was put on a stage as a progressive today who also has those same policies and leanings. So if we're going to make education an issue here in Georgia, then we got to actually dig in deep. We can't say, okay, well, you know, she did this on HOPE, which is, you know, a scholarship fund for, for college. But, you know, we're not talking about college readiness. We're not talking about her stance on issues pertaining to K through 12 or pre-K. You know, we, 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 we can't expect children to go to college and not have the actual support on the ground level for that to happen. We have to have these, these conversations. And ignoring people's support for school vouchers because Trump is bad is a really bad strategy. And th that whole Trump is bad strategy just lost the, Trump, the Georgia 6 race down here. So we need to do better. We need to dance a man better. It lost the country. You're right. And it doesn't happen by sitting here smiling and, and, and doing the respectability thing. I want to I want to ask you next. So 
Uh, we'll get back to Stacey Evans in a minute, but I think broader, you hit on a point that's interesting because whether it was the Democratic National Convention last year or after, you know, the Democratic establishment by and large saying you guys need to fall in line, you guys are, you know, you're, you're helping Trump or you guys, uh, you know, stop the purity, stop this, and we're hearing it now. To me, that's exactly what alienated Bernie Sanders voters from even considering Hillary Clinton after. I can't tell you, I was covering the DNC on the ground there, and the way they treated, uh, it wasn't all Hillary Clinton's campaign, the DNC, all that, the way they treated delegates at the DNC, uh, the way people were treated on social media by, by more Hillary establishment backers, it's almost like, no, no, do not, do not uh, speak out on policy do not speak out because then you're working against us. Um, and I think that's alienating the grassroots even more. I mean, I think that one of the things that we do is compartmentalize oppression, right? And we say, Bernie Rose, for example, oh, you're Don't sexist. Me. Well, I mean, not you. <laughs> but like, but I've actually been called a Bernie bro, which I was confused about. But like, we, we will talk about that, which is rightful. Like, we should talk about sexism within the party. But it cannot be a Bernie Sanders problem. It's a Democratic Party problem. It's a progressive problem. The same way white supremacy is not just a Republican problem. There's an issue when we are shouted down here at Net roots by white folks who are who are who claim to be pro progressive, who purport progressivism, who are shouting at us because we've embarrassed them, because we didn't get the mic, because we didn't get white permission to get a mic, right? So we cannot we can no longer compartmentalize oppression, and we are saying trust black women because we are the backbone of not just the Democratic Party, because to be clear, we're the backbone of democracy, right? Yeah, and so that like was that. that was a Noah's line. I, like that. I took that from her. But yeah, I mean so. We are telling you to trust us because we have seen this before and we are leading national movements and national spaces around education equity. And so you have someone like Stacey Evans who's getting on stage. How are you progressive in getting on the same stage as the NEA when the NEA has literally put money in Georgia to fight against the policies that you support? You know, also what I don't understand, maybe you could help me out. This isn't because I'm progressive. This is just because I'm intelligent. This, the, the, the. The, oh, like the Stacey Evans of the world are working against the political uh, wins. She's working against polls. She's working against where the energy's at. If, even if you didn't believe in it, if you just wanted to be a, a, a smart politician, you would, you would go towards uh, ec um, education equity or against privatization because this is where the most votes are trending. But it seems that the Democratic Party, not just with uh, education private privatization, but even with continuing, I mean, Nancy Pelosi literally just hauled in $26 million from the usual suspects so far this year. It just came out. Uh, bigger, her, the biggest fundraising hall in two years and that for the De Democratic Party. And that's after we just lost an election that we outspent them two to one. It seems like they're still focusing on the same way of doing things and kind of this neoliberal centrist borderline conservatism rather than just, oh, wow, I have a progressive army in front of me. Maybe we should cater to those policies and those positions. Well, part of the, part of the problem is the Democratic Party is led by consultants who make a whole lot of money off of ads. I wish my colleague Nomi Kikonsu was watching. Yeah. She's been railing about this. So well, it's, it's, it didn't just start with Trump or this last election cycle. We've lost over a thousand seats at the state level. <clears throat> Excuse my voice. So, I mean, this, this is, we know that investing in communities of color is the only way you win national elections. Barack Obama did it twice. He won twice. So, I mean, like, you can spend as much money as you want to. If you're not talking to black and brown voters, you're not going to win a national election. And if the party don't learn that, the party's going to go by wayside. But I, I, don't really, I don't really care about the Democratic Party that much. I do care about people that's claiming to be progressive. Like, that's my, that's my thing. Black people, the history of black folk is progressive. This, the first progressive idea in this country is letting my people go from slavery. That was black women leading. You, heard, you had Jeff Weaver on a panel talking about <laughs> Talking yeah, about a 64 yeah, moment. moment. How, the hell, how, how the hell can you have that space and not recognize what's going on? Here in Charlottesville and all over this country, the Democratic Party, the progressive movement, if they don't have a litmus test and it's written by people that look like us, especially these women, then we're, we're going to continue to lose elections up and down the ballot.
And I think that also it speaks to, I mean, we always come back to like letting black women lead. And so if you don't have black women who are in charge and making these like moves and these like decisions of the top of the party, then you're, it's, it's not going to be reflective of the community. So we have really dope black women who do really dope things. And, uh, and if they're not women. being, and, right, and black, brothers. black brothers. Yeah, <laughs> And if they're not being included in the conversation, and not only included in the conversation, but allowed space to lead the conversation, because a lot of times what you hear is people wanting black folks for the sake of black folks, but not not our ideas. Mm -hmm. So they want us to parrot white ideas to be like, oh, okay, that sounds right. But if we're not asking people, what is your experience? And we're not actually centering people who are the most impacted by the things that we're passing or trying to pass, it's not gonna work. Well, let me just keep it real. And I'm sure you've, ex you, you've seen this, but this is what I've seen in the Democratic Party in politics in general, but especially the Democratic Party. Uh, the candidates that want to run for president or governor, uh, a couple years before, they start going down and hanging out at the churches, and they get to know the pastors, and they get to know the congregations, and they go to, they go to uh, uh, you know, award ceremonies, and they go to uh, events for the African American community. And then during the, before the South Carolina primary, oh, they, want, they have a plan for African Americans. Then when they get elected, uh, it kind of falls by the back, backside. I got to be honest. I, I'm not trying to be condescending because I'm a white person, but I don't think R President Obama did enough for the African-American community. So I feel like we're still seeing that even at these conferences. There's a lot of parroting of uh, talks about empowering the African-American movement, uh, women leading these things, but I don't see the policies that are backing it up. Well, I mean, to speak to that, I think that is something that we need to fundamentally change the nature of the way we do and engage in politics. I mean, for you covering and being a part of like the outgrowth of what we saw, the progressive movement, political revolution, which really was an extension of so many other movement, you know, spaces and moments that before it, you know, Occupy, Black Lives Matter, climate change, the, the, the resurgence of anti-war movement activity, you know, after Iraq and Afghanistan. I mean, we need to engage differently, but we also need to be year round us, not, not demanding that the the Democrats or whomever, the Green, even the Green Party. We should not be demanding these parties be the ones who lead us. We need to be leading them in, in, in innovative strategies for engaging with our communities. And yes, as a black woman, I'm going to talk about black communities, I'm talking about brown communities, but I haven't lived in West Virginia for seven years. I'm going to talk about Appalachia too, because I recognize the commonality and the thread that goes through all of us when we're talking about different forms of oppression and stuff like that. So if we can't acknowledge that these things are still existing within these spaces, like I, I, I appreciate my sister. Paula Jean Swearingen, I love you, Paula, you know, for getting on stage when she spoke yesterday and recognizing a struggle that's not necessarily her own living in a predominantly white state in America. And that's what we need to start building, those alliances and that conversation. But we need to start talking to people because we've already seen when the West Virginia Democratic Party is a perfect example of selling out the people for the win only to ultimately lose with Jim Justice once again reverting back to being a Republican. So we have to, we have to be local. You know, everyone keeps saying be local, but we need to actually train people people on what being local means. We got to bring revolution to scale. Right. You know what I'm saying? So like we have to work with people to understand how to engage in the process. We have to go in touch and talk to those people who have not been talked to in past cycles. I mean, almost 49, I think it was like 49% or 40, no, it was 40 percent of black voters did not vote in this last election. Why? It's not because they're ignorant or they don't care. They literally have been left behind. When we look at the American population as a whole, approximately, what was it, 49% or so did not vote in election as a whole. Why? because nearly half the country has been left out of the process and we can't engage like that. So I don't need Senator Warren. I don't need, you know, I know folks love Bernie. That's cool. You know what I'm saying? I like Bernie too. But at the same time, this was always about us and we have to be the leaders that we see through independent media, which uplifts democracy in action itself, through our own individual work. Even if you're showing up at your kid's school or at a school in your community, that is actually making a change. So we need to be engaging and finding ways to bring training to communities. We need to be engaging find a way to help organizers on the ground get funding. We need to find a way to help empower the people who are actually going to lead the movements to make the decisions that are going to create the change that we need instead of waiting that one of these hopefuls for 2020 is going to change it around. Because I agree with you, no, no president, whether it's President Obama or anyone else, has made some radical change that has uplifted any of us. However, what I will give him credit for was the way in which they organize and engage people 
people during the campaign. My yeah. biggest critique and criticism is that did not carry through. Yeah. But that's also on us because we didn't hold him accountable. So I know folks get mad at I know folks get mad at him and other people, but we have to hold them accountable. So I, I look at examples like what happened down in Jackson, Mississippi with Choke Lake Mumba and the Jackson Kush plan and how that was an outgrowth of people's assembly movements. This is the type of thing we need. We need radical listening, radical action being brought to all of our communities. Because otherwise, we're going to have them idiots in Charlottesville taking over. Right. And quite honestly, you being white is not going to save you from them either. I know. <laughs> I, I, I was just standing right there in Charlotte, too. Uh, but I also think that we have to talk about, it's not just black for black's sake or brown for brown's sake. Absolutely. We actually have to talk about pe centering people who have the experiences, right? Who are actually directly impacted by the policies that we want to pass and the things that we're talking about. So when we talk about agenda, if we're not centering people, if we're talking about policies around bail reform, if we're not centering the loved ones and the people who are incarcerated, then what are we talking about? I can read a book and talk all day, but I'm not going to come up with anything that's innovative and creative and actually useful as somebody who actually is experiencing this. And so if we're not doing that, which we haven't been, people are going to get left behind. And that's worth, that, I, I feel like that's a form of voter suppression. If I don't see myself reflected in democracy, if I don't, if I see that I've been voting for generations and nothing is really changing for me, that is, that is actually going to suppress my vote. Mm -hmm. And I also think um, whether it's the Democratic Party knocking on the doors or it's you guys knocking on doors or whomever's knocking on doors, Organizing is fine, is good, it's important. But if you don't if you don't actually have the policy substance behind it, it only does so much. I'm 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 hearing a lot of conferences like this, uh, you know, about we need to be, get more local and better organize and share your values and all these kind of things that are very uh, kind of like the side dishes around the plate. But if you're not pushing for Medicare for all, if you're not pushing for free public college, if you're not pushing for education equity, if you're not pushing, someone had a great idea yesterday about universal legal care, which I've never even thought about. I mean, uh, if you're not pushing to kind of remove the welfare reform generation, which still hasn't been remedied. I mean, I could go on and on. If you are not knocking on doors with the right policies that will cross uh, party lines, if will cross party lines, gender lines, race lines, then you can local, you can local organize till you're blue in the face. People, people need to be moved. I, I, would, I, w I want to say that, um, I mean, I like your litany of policies, but I think they're, they're missing something. They're yours. You can't tell communities what they need. You can tell them what you think they need. And that's the problem with Democrats and people coming into communities. We try to tell people what we think they need or what's best going to move them without asking people. That's what getting local means to me. When you're organizing local communities, you shouldn't even be in those communities without talking to them. Like, you need to listen. You need to be listening to what the community tell you its need. We can't come in and say you need Medicaid for all and expect people to get behind it. How? When, when they can't even get their dad out of jail because of a speeding ticket and he can't afford the bail. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, like, we're, we're, that's the wrong, I think the wrong thing is we keep coming telling people what they need. And that's, that's, it don't work. I mean, the Democratic parties and progressives are responsible for low information voters, just like they're responsible for, for high information voters. Which segment of the population they choose to make low is also a smart decision or a bad decision. And as we can tell, you guys for so long have excluded black and brown people from that, from that high information population. Part of that is because you think, you, the proverbial you, you, white people believe that Whatever those consultants are telling them, and that's who Democrats spend their money with, progressives, including Bernie, including, yeah. right? Three white men walked away with 40% of his 220 million raised. Three white men. Those three white men can't speak to nothing plaguing my community, not, not Nathan. And that's part of the problem. Y'all spend y'all money with white consultants and don't listen to us.